Many years ago in the small town of Bethany, there were two sisters who lived together. Their names were Martha and Mary. Little is known about their circumstances, but at that time it was unusual for women of their age to be unwed and living independently. One possibility is while they were still quite young, their parents died. This would have left them orphaned and without a dowry, which meant marriage and stability were well out of reach. Another possibility is that they'd been widowed. What we do know is that his sisters, they were quite different from one another. Martha was practical and task-oriented. You're not brushing right. And a bit controlling. While Mary was more of a thinker, a dreamer. <laughs> with a flair for the dramatic. <laughs> Despite these differences, they had to rely on each other. And because of this became quite close. At the same time, like in any relationship, they often found themselves at odds. Martha frequently complained that she had to do everything herself. However, <laughs> when Mary did try to help. I can do it. Yes, but I'd like to eat sometime today. Mary, on the other hand, found Martha exhausting. Constantly working, never stopping, and always nagging. And yet when Martha did try to relax, Martha's relaxing only seemed to put Mary on edge. What? I can feel you worrying. Well, I'm sorry, but somebody I has to hold this house forward. together. Their contrasting personalities often caused a great deal of tension, uh, particularly for their brother, Lazarus. Uh, what are you doing, reading a scroll? Lazarus was the peacekeeper of the family. Uh, Though it seemed his sisters were unaware of this. Now, a young and controversial rabbi and healer named Jesus had befriended their family. Welcome! And would occasionally visit with his disciples. Jesus! Jesus loved them all dearly. They had always given so freely and asked for nothing in return. They who had so little. Martha was thrilled to be playing host and was intent on creating an evening that Jesus and his disciples would never forget. She couldn't have been happier until... In those days, it was unacceptable for a woman to be taught by a rabbi, let alone to be sitting at his feet. Martha was mortified. It was obvious that Mary was taking advantage of Jesus' kindness to satisfy her own incessant curiosity. People were clearly uncomfortable. Martha thought perhaps if she caused a nastar in the kitchen, Mary would feel obliged to come and help. Did you, uh... No, I'm fine! The entire evening was unraveling. Martha felt ill. She knew this couldn't continue. She had to do something. Somehow, she had to save Jesus from her sister. Lord, I don't know if you, uh, noticed that my sister left me to do all the work by myself. So, you want to tell her to give me a hand in the kitchen? Jesus gently pointed out to Martha that she was concerning herself with far too many things, when in actuality there is need of only one thing, and that her sister Mary had chosen the better part. Martha was shocked. Not only was Jesus undisturbed by Mary's presence, he was inviting her to join them as well. She felt incredibly foolish and felt that somehow Mary was to blame. After Jesus' visit, 
Tensions rose in the house. Um... Martha sent for Jesus immediately. But for reasons all his own, Jesus delayed answering their plea for several days. So when he finally arrived, it was too late. Jesus assured Martha that it was not too late. But Martha was skeptical, partly because she'd prepared her brother's body for burial several days prior. Seeing Martha's doubt, Jesus was quite frank with her, asking, Do you believe in me? I believe that you're the Messiah, the Son of God. Martha was taken aback by what she had said, and even more so at how deeply she believed it. She suddenly felt compelled to fetch Mary. <laughs> Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Seeing his beloved friends in such anguish overwhelmed him. <laughs> Jesus asked to be taken to Lazarus. Mary and Martha assumed that Jesus intended to mourn and pray over the tomb. But when they arrived, Jesus had the tomb open and called for Lazarus to come forth. <gasps> wow, I could, I could really use a cup of coffee. Lazarus! <laughs> Oh, um, hi, Lazarus. Really glad to see you. Over there. Though there were threats on Jesus' life, he and his disciples returned to check on Lazarus. But this time, instead of intently listening at Jesus' feet, Mary anointed his feet with perfumed oil. Uh, um, that's, um, uh, that's for... Martha was livid. This perfume was for embalming and was extremely expensive. Not to mention, they'd already wasted an entire bottle on Lazarus. Mary, I... <laughs> At that moment, Martha began to understand... Never mind. Yeah. Goodbye. Yes, Goodbye, Jesus. We may never see him again. I know. On that day, both Mary and Martha recalled Jesus' words that there is need of only one thing. In the land of Phoenicia, a Greek province, then controlled by the Roman Empire, there once lived a woman and her young daughter who lived a decidedly humble existence. At this time, the people of this land were known as Syrophoenicians and were roundly ignored by their Roman rulers. They were wholly despised and even persecuted by their neighbors, the nation of Israel. Mainly because they were Gentiles, which is another way of saying not Jewish. These challenges were only exacerbated when a child was possessed by a demon. At that time, her lack of status, her lack of money, her lack of Jewish heritage, and not to mention her lack of being a man, would have significantly reduced any chance of acquiring help for her daughter. Hello. I, I was... Could you help? 
my daughter is sick. And the only help she could find was rather unhelpful. She had asked everyone, tried everything, but to no avail. She had never felt more helpless in her entire life, which was saying quite a lot. She found herself left with one recourse, prayer. And then... Jesus! It's the healer Jesus of Nazareth! He's here! She had heard of this teacher named Jesus and of his compassion for the poor and sick. And for a moment, she felt a glimmer of hope. But then, she remembered something else she'd heard about this Jesus. He was a Jew. Historically, her encounters with Jews had not gone well. Hey! What are you doing? That well is for Jews only! Get lost, you Gentile dog! The likelihood that Jesus would help her was extremely slim. Still, she had nothing to lose. If she were to have any chance of getting help from Jesus, she would have to be assertive, even insistent. As she drew closer and closer, her apprehension grew, thinking of all the ways things could go horribly wrong. If not for the love for her daughter, she may well have turned back. Upon arriving, she was met by disheartening news. Jesus' disciples explained that he was utterly exhausted. When Jesus had first begun to heal people, I can see! He had attempted to be as discreet as possible. I can see! Nevertheless, droves of people were soon following him everywhere, to the point that he no longer had any time to himself. It seemed Jesus had not come all the way to a town to help anyone, but to get away from everyone. And that was that. Or rather, it would have been. Something arose in her, a fire, an unrelenting passion. She realized that this was a best and last chance to save her daughter. This time, no was not an option. No. Yes! No! Yes! No! No! Yes! Stop it! Yes! Fine! <clears throat> Jesus was in no mood to be disturbed. <clears throat> Upon seeing Jesus, she realized that the disciples were not kidding. This may not have been the best time to bother Jesus, but at this point, what could she do? Lord, have mercy on me. She began to tremble, and Jesus' silence only raised her anxiety. Finally, Jesus spoke, telling her it was not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. No one was surprised by his response. A Jew calling a Gentile a dog, amongst other names, was commonplace, as was denying them any level of compassion. However, what happened next surprised everyone, including her. Yet even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. <sighs> Jesus was astounded by her faith and told the woman that because of her faith, her daughter was healed. Hmm. Her faith had healed her daughter. Her faith may also have done a great deal more. Up to that point, 
Jesus' ministry had been expressly for the nation of Israel, but not long after this, his ministry expanded to include Gentiles as well, a rather controversial move. And Jesus' disciples would continue this trend, reaching out to all people, regardless of race or nation, sharing the good news across the known world throughout the formation of the Christian church. This is a sheep. <laughs> and this is also a sheep. <laughs> and this is more often than not the norm. <laughs> Life is often difficult for the sheep. Subsisting primarily upon long grasses and clovers, the sheep have often found themselves victims of their own insatiable appetites. Or the insatiable appetites of their natural predators. Or the insatiable appetite of the garment industry. Life was not always so grim for the ovine. <laughs> the sweetness of the forbidden fruit was spoiled by a bitter aftertaste. Clearly, survival outside the garden required a knowledgeable guide. In the book of Luke, Jesus spoke of a shepherd who owned 100 sheep. He asked, if one wandered off, will the shepherd not leave the 99 to go look for the one? Sheep! Sheep! Here, sheep! <sighs> Easy now. Easy. If the shepherd finds a lost sheep, is he not happier about finding the one who was lost than about the 99 who were not? Friends, rejoice with me! I have found my lost sheep! Another time, Jesus spoke of the good shepherd, the best shepherd of all. This, however, is not the good shepherd. This is a hired hand, a mediocre shepherd at best, and a bad shepherd at worst.
Good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. Here, sheep, sheep, oh, sheep. <laughs> <laughs> One would be remiss to not mention that watching over sheep also takes unearthly amounts of patience. The shepherd has a symbiotic relationship with his sheep. The sheep give their life to the shepherd. The shepherd gives his way of life over to the sheep. But there are those who look to disrupt this relationship. No matter the danger and no matter the risk, the Good Shepherd defends his flock. Oh